Okay, so don't build another Tower of Babel. So let me start with actually <clears throat> the story about Babel. So, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose stop might reach upon the heaven. So they started building a really big tower because they wanted to defy the Lord, God. And God, looking in amusement, saw people building this tower. And he went on and said, OK, let me confuse them. And he basically changed or made everybody speak a different language so that they wouldn't understand each other. Y la gente empezó a hablar en diferentes idiomas. They couldn't understand each other. Sie wussten nicht mehr, was los war. Es war wirklich komisch y nadie entendía qué es lo que estaba sucediendo. And I suppose que nadie que está aquí is really understanding what I'm really saying. So I'd rather stop. So there's two lessons learned, actually, from, from this biblical event. Um, which I think are quite important the way we build software and the way we interact with our customers. For one, we've got language. I mean, we develop software, it's about language. We write software to communicate, to communicate what our customers are trying to do, to communicate their business value, to communicate whatever they're doing into software. Now, language is actually this cognitive ability that we have as humans to translate our ideas, our concepts, and communicate them to others. As opposed to speech, speech is just a form of communication. Speech can found, for example, in birds. You have seen parrots that can mimic the way we talk but they don't have the syntactical acquisition of this language. They don't understand what they're saying. They're lacking this language. So from there, I started thinking and looking at Rails applications, actually. And the way we build these applications actually makes me sad, because we have tools like Active Record that help us actually to reach into the database, get some data, show it, present it to the customers, and work that way, which is a very convenient and a very easy way to work. But it leads to applications that are rather cruddy, I would say, instead of conveying what the business really wants to say, what the business really wants to do with this application. What is their domain? Have we ever thought about it? Now, everybody of us has seen something like that. User find. What does it mean to find a user in your application? I mean, every application has users, or most have. And unless you're actually doing some kind of application that is specialized in finding people, saying find to a user is actually not really the context of the domain you're working with. It's just reaching out into the database and figuring out or giving me that row, that particular row of data. We can have a little bit more extreme examples which do the same thing and I agree with Charlie Sheen here. What the heck is this? You know, what are we trying to say here? Can anybody really understand what's going on? Well, I, I might know one person in the audience who might. 
<laughs> but, for, but for the rest of us, I think it's quite hard to figure out what is going on here. The problem with most applications is that we don't really focus on the domain. We don't really focus on our customer needs, on our customer's language. We can find other examples, like inside of controller, where this is a simple example. I mean, it's not that horrible, as we, said, we saw before, where we create a new trade with some parameters that are passed from the view. And if the trade has been saved, we actually act upon it in a way or another. Now, some would say this is actually quite clean. That's, that code is OK, looks OK. But what does trade new mean? What does it really mean? Or what does trade save in a trading system actually mean? Do traders save trades? Do they really? They don't. They don't do that. They might book a trade, right? but they don't save them. They don't save them anywhere in a bank, in an account or something. They're doing something different. And we lack, usually, the time, ability to actually listen to them and actually figuring out what is really they want to do. Now, this happens for obvious reasons. You know, in, in Rails, we've got active record, which follows the pattern of active record. And this pattern actually says that the database access, very explicitly talking about it, and is encapsulated in our domain object. Now, as you can see from the pattern, is, this pattern is actually giving us that access. It's making it possible to access the database. It's actually showing it, right? It's showing to the outside world, to the clients of your application, or at least the controllers, which are clients to your models, that, hey, if you want to find something in the database, this is how, right? So we're exposing the database to the outside. Now, in a way, is I would say that this actually defies the single responsibility principle, in a way. It's not really the case, but in a way, you are giving your clients, or this object is offering to your clients, two responsibilities. It's basically telling you, you know what, you can work with my domain, but you can as well reach out into the database. You can do two things here. And that is not, for me, a single responsibility anymore you're actually reaching into the database, which you possibly shouldn't. Or you should at least not see it. Now, the other patterns, like the domain model, which sounds similar, right? It's very similar to Active Record from the sound of it. You've got an object model which incorporates the data and the behavior. So at the end of the day, yes, it's reaching out into the database, but no, it's not showing you. Right? It's just doing it. Why? Because we're keeping the data very close to our objects, but we are modeling it in a different way. Now, if we look at some code that would reflect that in a way or another, we find things like appointment book on a date. Or if you're talking about a telecoms application, subscriber provision new data plan or trade pending compliance approval. All these methods would actually, very probable, look into the database, crunch some data, and return whatever action they did. But we're not showing it. We are actually speaking in the language our customers are speaking at that moment. Now, if you go back to this controller we saw before, where we could see the, tra uh, the trait being created and saved. This could be rewritten in a different way, where you say, hey, book a trade, and if the trade was booked successfully, then act on it, which actually reflect reflects much better the language that your customers might be using. Obviously, I don't think that all of you are 
working on trades, but you get the, the idea. Now, as, a, as some tips, when you're doing this, when you're working with your data and with your application, um, you should try to encapsulate your active record calls into your domain models. If you have to use active record, if you want to use active record, basically, as a rule of thumb, you could always say the only object in your application that is allowed to actually use active record methods, like finders and all these methods, is actually the same object that is the model. So find methods would only be found inside your model, where internally he is doing the finding, internally he is doing the saving, internally he is crunching the data and exposed to your controller, you wouldn't see that. You basically just work with your domain. It's a very lively domain. It's a domain where objects work together in a way. Data gets saved, data gets changed, data gets created, but you don't see it. You have this graph of objects that are kind of working together. You can also use name scopes with Active Record, which more or less do the same thing. It's like using more like the power of Active Record in that case, which is a similar approach to encapsulating this method calls. There's another part that we can actually learn from the history of Babel. I'll call it Habris. Now, there was a Jewish Roman historian called uh, Flavius Josephus, who actually said that what the people at Babel did was an hubristic act defying God. So what does that actually mean? What does hubris mean? It's basically when we are arrogant, when we lose touch for what other people or the reality of other people and we put ourselves upon them. We are more important than them. And as developers, we usually are quite arrogant. There's a lot of ego between us, right? And what happens is that our customers are wrong, right? They don't know what they're talking about. They tell us a problem, and we listen to it a little bit, and then we go, well, but what they really mean is this. What they really mean is this other thing. You know, they don't know really what they're talking about. And it is actually quite interesting how, how we do that because our customers know quite well what they're talking about. It's just us that we think that we need to translate everything they say into something we believe is right. So to avoid doing this, to avoid being so egoistic, to avoid not listening to your customers, there are certain tricks or certain things you can do as part of your development process or as part of your interaction with your customers. Now, one of the first things I've seen which are quite successful and maybe at the same time quite scary when you do it because you think, oh my God, you know, how is this going to play out? So ask stupid questions. If you don't understand something, ask. Always ask. It's very interesting to figure out that this question you had that you thought was stupid wasn't stupid at all. You just didn't understand something. Your customers, you have to think as well, they work in a certain domain. They've been working possibly for years doing something. And they have this lingo that they use. They're used to it, right? And they don't, might not understand that some people who come outside of that domain don't understand that language, right? So you need to figure those things out. 
and question, just question, make the stupid question in the world. What's a trade? I, uh, well, a trade is so and so and so, and then start explaining. What's a broker? I don't understand. I had that recently. I didn't really know what a security was. What is that? Now, it might sound stupid, and actually, your customer will look at you like, oh my god, he doesn't know that, right? But you will find the answer. And as funny as it is, there is no such thing really as a stupid question. We actually say, ask stupid questions, but they are not really stupid. And the only thing I can say, there are no stupid questions. They might be just stupid answers. <laughs> right? <laughs> that, must, that could have been the question, how many cigarettes can you put in your nose? You know? <laughs> Well, the question might seem stupid, but actually that could only lead to that stupid answer. <laughs> Another thing that you need to do, that you really need to make sure you do when you're, when you're working with your customers, is to keep the conversation constant. There's no such thing as talking too much. Joe was saying it in his previous talk, there is no such thing as over-communication. There is no such thing. Um, I worked in a project a couple of years ago um, where we were modeling a bingo server, actually. That was quite fun. Now, we actually spend like at least an hour a day talking to our customers, playing bingo, hearing him talk, going to bingo halls, you know, just listening, you know, just listening and taking notes and figuring out what they were really talking about. What is this world? You know, what's the zombie halls where people go and play? It's actually quite bizarre when you go to a bingo hall. If you haven't done it ever, do it. It's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and so we kept on talking to these people, and you know, we were not understanding certain things about the tickets, about how they call the numbers, and how they really work. And so we kept com 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 conversing with them, talking with them. And figuring all these little things out, and it turned out that we did a really good application that reflected actually whatever they did in these bingo halls. And you know, we challenged them a lot. It's like, but when you say ticket, do you mean this paper thing? What is it actually? You know, constantly asking these questions. What is it, this all about? So it's really, really important that you keep these conversations flowing that you understand what they are talking about, that you really challenge your understanding and challenge them to actually explain it. Because they, it's not that they can't or they don't want to, it's just that they don't have the opportunity to talk to you and you're not giving them that. Um, a lot of times I've found that we as developers, we sometimes act like this doctors, you know, we walk with our white ropes. You know, we know everything, don't worry. I do this, right? You don't know anything, I'm the technician, I know what I'm doing. And it's quite weird, you know, because we don't know anything. You know, we know what we know, we know about technology, we know about solving problems, that's our strength, right? But in order to solve a problem, I need to understand that problem pretty well. So keep on the conversation. There's another way of actually, once you're having these conversations, you can actually start writing cucumbers. So you write them like this, right? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But this is something common. This is something you see a lot. People writing cucumber steps like this, and or scenarios, and Again, it shows this arrogance that we have, right? Somebody's telling me, you know, I'm actually quite a forgetful person. I, I forget things a lot, and I need to have a place where I write down some events in a calendar so that I don't forget them. Right, and we go, oh, this is how you do it. And it's like, well, hang on, this is quite brittle, you know, wh why, why should I do it this way? Where is the business value here? Where I'm reflecting here, 
what you want to do. I'm actually not. I'm just telling you how to do it. I'm not listening to you. I'm absolutely not listening to what you're telling me and I'm creating this image in my mind, this is how it's done. And I know it because I'm right. I'm always right. Everybody knows that. So, hey, this is how you do it. Now, a much better way, a rather more pleasing way, maybe polite way, as Jim was saying, of actually writing your scenarios would be something like this. Now, this sounds much more as something that your customer might have said. So you write these notes down like that, knowing that, oh, yeah, given I'm forgetful, so I want to create this event, and it should appear in my calendar. The funny thing about this, about this conversation and this language that is happening here, is that suddenly you're not anymore focusing on the technology you're using. You're not anymore focusing on how to do it, but you're focusing on the language. You're focusing on the language of your customer. You're focusing on everything they really care about, which is their business value. And in the background of that, you will actually write whichever you need to do as in, I click here, I fill in this, I fill in that. That's happening in the background. That's something that they shouldn't care about. I've been actually talking quite quick. <laughs> okay, so here are some advices that I can give you. Don't expose your active records methods to the outside world. Let these be handled internally. Use name scopes, encapsulate your methods. Make sure that you listen to your customers. Make sure that you understand their problem. Make sure that you talk a lot to them. It really pays off. And don't be afraid to asking stupid questions. And last and not least, I'm really quick, I'm really sorry for that. <laughs> uh, don't forget to empty your cup. You have to go into every situation prepared to learn something, prepared to understand, prepared to actually get all the information you can from your customers to actually make this work. And maybe instead of emptying your cup, quoting Dave in his keynote, maybe what you should do is emptying your beer. Thank you. <laughs>